So what I want to talk to you about is these two guys who, um, so this, the work of the Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler is, this is where I, uh, where everyone would place the beginning of modern astronomy. So the laws of Kepler that we'll talk about soon, that's the laws that we still hold them as correct today. So this is, um, this is the where I would mark beginning of modern astronomy. So um, another way to put it is in my typical dismissive attitude, everything that these guys did, Aristotle through Galileo, they are wrong in some crucial way. It's not just the approximation, they're just wrong in some crucial assumption. So, um, I mean, there are things that Galileo did this, well, actually. So one thing that Galileo said, something called the principle of relativity, I guess we still hold that to be correct, as long as you are careful about what you mean by relative. Um, but so in, in the context of astronomy, um, everything up through here has some crucial assumption that, uh, um, that's wrong. So, um, the contribution of Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, it can be divided up pretty nicely. And this is, um, I think Brahe actually set out to try to um, settle this, uh, this dispute, you know, which is actually correct. And what Brahe realized uh, as he was uh, trying that, um, he realized that the available data was actually not all that good. So, you know, people have been observing stars for a very long time, but, um, there is no uh, lengthy record of observation made from a single spot, uh, carefully kept over a long duration of time. Because you know, drift like this, I said a month, but that's kind of an exaggeration. The, the discrepancies, they start to show when you are observing these planets for years, like a decade. So what Bryce set out to do, I think from some royal grant somewhere, um, Bryce is the one who collected the data. He um, set up an ast um, observatory, and I don't, I don't think he used any telescopes. He just made the observation with his bare eyes, and he kept a very careful record for something like 10 years. Um, so he recorded, the, for example, position of Mars uh, over a long duration of time. And, but Bright died before he was able to see any um, significant breakthrough from his data. I think uh, uh, from what I read about him, he did subscribe to the heliocentric model. He thought it was uh, some version of a heliocentric model that would be correct. But um, he died um, before uh, he saw a final result that's coming from his data. And that brings us to the guy uh, who is, uh, whose name we use for the loss that we are going to introduce today. Kepler is the guy who analyzed an, an, uh, uh, analyzed Brahe's data. And there's a very interesting story behind it. Apparently, he analyzed them in the three years while there was some legal dispute with the uh, Brahe's uh, estate after he died, whether who should get the data. And he just analyzed that while the dispute was ongoing. <laughs> um, and he published what's called three laws of, um, three laws of planetary motion. And that's uh, what I want to go over. But um, so let me write, uh, reserve some space here. But before we talk about those three laws of planetary motion, I want to spell out what kind of assumptions or laws seem to be in this model so that it's clear, it's clearer to everyone what we are correcting in the Copernican model. So, so Kepler came up with these three laws. Kepler's uh, three laws of planetary motion. So, um, so before we talk about this, let's just spell out what, um, what we think the laws of Copernican uh, planetary motion would be. So um, do you see any feature here that you would say, this is a rule that planets must follow as they move around the sun. Mm. Tell me some rules. Planets have, 
planets move, uh, okay, have a circular motion. Let's make it a little more precise. Planet, for example, Mars, moves in a circle. Uh, specify the circle for me. Like, what are the features of circle? What do you need to define a circle? You need the radius, and what else? Center. You need the center. You need the, to know the position of the circle and how big it is. Where is the center of the circle? Yeah, sun at the center. So yeah, that's actually the key feature of this model. You would say a planet move in a circle with sun at the center. Good. Okay. Any other laws of um, Copernican model? I guess that's probably it. That's the biggest one. <laughs> that's the one that's clearly visible from this diagram. Any other laws you might come up with, um, you kind of need more information to do that. Um, but So that's the biggest feature that you see here. And this is the feature that I'm telling you is wrong. Planets do not move in a circle with the sun at the center. They don't. And that's really, that's the source why Copernican model always had some error. Because it started out with this assumption that was not correct. And, you know, um, Copernicus assumed this for the same reason that Aristotle assumed the sun, uh, Earth was at the center. Because Earth being at the center made the intuitive sense, right? And when Copernicus began to go out of the box, start to think maybe Earth, even though it doesn't seem to be moving, maybe it's moving somehow. We are just not feeling it. He was trapped by another box. He was trapped by the boxes thinking that, well, what's the shape that these objects should move? He thought circle is the natural one. Um, some people had it like circle is perfect, so heavenly things are perfect. I don't know if he thought that, but uh, Copernicus thought circle is the reasonable shape for this to move in. And he got somehow locked into that. And um, this assumption that these planets move in a circle, uh, that's the key thing that's wrong about the Copernican model, model, because they do not move in a circle. So that brings us to Kepler's first law of planetary motion. So let me give you actual Kepler's laws. So Kepler's uh, first law of planetary motion is that exactly the statement that contradicts what um, it contradicts what Copernicus was assuming, that they move in a circle. Well, from Kepler's analysis of Bryce data, what he found to be true is planets move in, not a circle, but uh, I probably should do this in a different color. Move in an ellipse. with the sun at uh, one of the, I want to say focuses, but I'm pretty sure foci is the more common way to call it, so I'll say foci, so I don't, I want to say focuses, but foci is what most people say. Um, okay, do, who here remembers how we define an ellipse? Who here remembers how we define a circle? If you wanted to draw a perfect circle, how would you draw a circle? Like, you know, if I go like this, it would look circle-ish, but it's not really a circle, right? Because my hand could shake, so, you know, I might have done something that makes it not exactly a circle. Like, how would I construct a circle? How would I, you know, how do I draw in such a way that I make sure that what I'm drawing is actual circle? So it's like a center and then radius and then center. Center and radius. So what's special about radius? On the center, so all the is Center, so radius is the equal distance. That is that from center to all the points, right? Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, so okay, I can draw this this way. Let me put a dot here, 
as the center. And I have a bunch of magnets, so I assume I can use one of, well, or all of them to put down something. Um, let's, can I use this string? Um, I guess I can. Um, sorry, I'm not quite prepared to do this. <laughs> so if I want you to draw a circle, this is how I would draw it. Um, put a string around the pen to make sure that I'm going to be uh, drawing out the same distance from what I'm going to call my center. Uh, almost there. Okay, and I'm going to fix this down at the center with the help of this magnet. So, so here's my fixed point, and I make sure that it's drawn in a way. Oh, wait, this is way too big. <laughs> Let me make the radius a little bit smaller. Uh, so I make sure it's drawn in a way that the distance from this point to all the points on my circle are the same. Like that's how a circle is defined, right? And that's how you would draw the circle. I'm kind of trying to be careful because it actually starts wrapping around and I don't want to, uh, something like this, right? That's, the, that's how you saw so circle being defined in geometry. Okay? So actually with this definition of a circle, you can actually come up with a bunch of um, like a geometric theorems about uh, some you know, inscribed angles and like, all of this sounds somewhat familiar. So this is actually the brilliant achievement of Kepler. Remember what I said about astronomy being challenging because you don't actually have a bird's eye view of solar system like this. You have to infer all of this from what you can observe from Earth. So what Kepler did is he came up with some uh, geometric theorem that said if planets move in circle, then uh, there's some statement he can make about motion of Mars and I forget what that actual statement is. And when he tested the data against that statement, he found that orbit of Mars didn't satisfy that. The positions of Mars did not match with the, the prediction from a theorem that assumed that this circular path was the path of the, the planet. So what he did was he started guessing. He, once he realized that this common assumption was untrue, he started uh, sort of venturing out. Okay, if it's not a circle, what else can be? And what he settled on was, you know, he, he was trying to make a circle more general. And the shape that he settled on was ellipse. Anybody here remember how to define an ellipse? I mean, you know what it looks like, right? Ellipse looks kind of like this. This is a very elongated ellipse. But how would you define it mathematically? Uh, I have no idea. I don't know why there's a two. There's a word description for definition of an ellipse that doesn't use any equation. Asia, how is the uh, ellipse defined? Oh, okay, I thought you were raising your hand. All right, anybody here remember how ellipse was defined? It's not like this is not really something you have to know for this class, but it's a useful math knowledge to have if you're going to be in. Well, okay, it's more of a meta trivia, but it's still important to know the trivia. Maybe not. <laughs> no one here remembers how to define an ellipse? Yeah, I'll give it to you uh, because I want to go into break. Um, and when we come back from break, we'll do the second and the third law. So, um, so the first law uh, is, it, so Kepler's trying to generalize. He realized that circular path is not the path so he's trying to say, think, oh, all right, what well, looks kind of like a circle, but it's not exactly a circle. And the shape that he guessed was ellipse. And this is why ellipse is similar to a circle. It's defined in a similar way. So to define an ellipse, you need actually two points. Um, so these are what's called the foci of ellipse. An ellipse, so let me draw ellipse uh, superposed to this. So ellipse looks like this. It has uh, two points that are called focus. They are each called focus, so plural is foci. Good. 
uh, or focuses. Um, and using these focuses, the way you define the path for the ellipse is you use the idea that was similar to a circle. You make a distance the same. But it's not the, because you have two points to measure distance to. It's not a single distance. It's more like a two distances. So let's see. I want to have similar size. Um, so it's more like a two distances. So let's say, um, so this length of the string is what we are keeping constant. So uh, when you are drawing the path of the ellipse, this is what it would look like. You have one fixed point here. And you have another fixed point here. So the quantity that you are keeping constant would be the sum of the two distances. So let me, uh, let me trace out a path that's uh, consistent with that. So let me do that in purple. So I am going to just uh, put this uh, string around this. And um, as I try to move this purple marker, it will get constrained by um, the length of the string. So, okay, let me go back the other way. Make sure the strings don't come off. Okay, that. And for the bottom, I want to actually go down this way. And that. This is what an ellipse looks like. It does look a little bit different from circle, right? And you can see that it's defined in a different way than a circle. Does it look similar to a circle? Yeah, um, um, it, I mean, so this is why for thousands of years, people never thought to look beyond the circle. Because um, this is actually a fairly elliptical ellipse. As in these four sides, they are pretty far apart. But even then, the resulting shape, like, you know, if you didn't have another circle inside it, like, you might not have guessed that this is actually not a circle. So. Um, but this key difference is the difference between the Copernical model, which uh, at the end is not exactly correct, and the Kepler's model, which is actually exactly correct. We can drive Kepler, well, not we, somebody who's a talent, not even me, uh, somebody who's good at vector calculus can drive Kepler's laws uh, using uh, Newton's law of motion and what we are covering today, Newton's law of universal gravitation. So, um, so before we go into break, let me just end with this. This is the difference between um, the Copernican model and Kepler's model. In Copernican model, you place the sun here. Sun is at the center of the circle. So this is the Copernican model, Copernicus. And the way um, Kepler does it, Kepler would place his sun at one of the two foci. So he would say, oh, my sun, it's actually here. This is sun at one of the two focus. And this is the Kepler's model. Now, why one of the two? What's going on at the other focus? Nothing. It, it's not symmetric. It doesn't have to be symmetric. So in a planet's orbit, there is a part of the orbit that's closest to the sun. We call that perihelion. Perihelion. And in a planet's orbit, there's a portion of the orbit that's farthest from the sun. We call that, uh, I keep misspelling this. I think it's aphelion. Um, but I may have misspelled it again. <laughs> um, it's called, a, it might be just the aphelion. This means away from the sun. This means uh, near the sun. So. And you know, when a planet is in the perihelion and when it's in aphelion, it actually does different things. So it's not symmetric. The sun is just at one of the two focus. Why one? Who knows? Um, but there's nothing. There's a, there's actually nothing at the other focus. There's no second sun at the other focus. Yeah. So so this is the model that we are going to start from and state the next to, to Kepler's laws of um, planetary motion and describe how that relates to the some laws of dynamics that you already know actually. <laughs>